Every fall and spring, my husband and I buy the topic of today's episode by the case for our allergies. And with a new baby in the house, we've been buying even more. We have a box in almost every room. We most likely take them for granted, until we run out, that is. In this episode, we'll look at the original, non-disposable version used for centuries, through the more recent invention most of us know and use today. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind tissues. But first, a quick message. If you've listened to the story behind for a while now, you probably have some awesome trivia saved up, ready to fire off whenever the subject of things like bubblegum, potato chips, or tattoos come up in conversation. Show off your trivia buff status with some gear from the story behind at our Story Behind Tea Public store, where you can get t-shirts, sweatshirts, onesies, mugs, and even a notebook to keep track of all the fun facts you come across during the day. What, am I the only person who does that? Visit the storybehindpodcast.com slash gear to check it out. Don't want to pay for it? I'll also be doing gear giveaways in the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook, so make sure you join. Before there were tissues, there were handkerchiefs. Carried as far back as ancient Egyptians in 2000 BCE, who carried white linen. And the first written reference to the handkerchief was made by the Roman poet Catullus in the first century AD. They continued to be used mostly for shielding faces from the sun and wiping sweat. In fact, by the 13th century, they were known as couvre in Old French, couvre meaning cover, and chief, or chef, meaning head. It was soon after renamed handkerchief by the English, as in hand, cover, chief. When Catherine de' Medici married Henry II, she brought to France the fashion of lace-bordered and scented handkerchiefs, making it the popular accessory to own, although Henry was said to have used them to clean his teeth. Shakespeare even used a handkerchief as the catalyst in the tragedy of Othello when Desdemona's handkerchief was planted on Cassio by Iago resulting in Desdemona's murder by Othello out of jealousy. Oh, sorry, should I have given a spoiler alert? One of the most storied uses of the handkerchief was Marie Antoinette in the 18th century, who was said to have torn pieces of lace from her dress and undergarments in a journey from Austria to France to wipe her tears as she was being brought to marry Louis XVI. She then brought handkerchiefs to the mainstream when she arrived, wishing to always have one on her for future tears. But this is considered to be more folklore than fact. However, she did decree that handkerchiefs be as wide as they are long, leading to a standardization of size of 10 by 10 inches or 11 and a half by 11 and a half inches, sizes that are still common today. Handkerchiefs for a while were considered taboo if seen outside the clothing. They were usually stuffed in pockets, purses, up sleeves, or in bodices, But with the two-piece suit coming into fashion by the 19th century, it became more customary for men to fold them up nicely and use them as pocket squares. Women would give a scented handkerchief to a man she showed favor to, or as the common portrayal went, she would intentionally drop her handkerchief for a knight or potential suitor to retrieve. By the way, they weren't always scented as a way for the owner to smell good. They were also used as face masks in a time before modern day plumbing. Handkerchiefs became even more romantic during World War II, when European and American soldiers would keep them as tokens of affection. But they were also useful as maps, which were printed on silk handkerchiefs for pilots during both world wars, in the event they were shot down and got lost. As you can imagine, using a cloth to wipe your nose resulted in easily spreading germs, not to mention having to carry around a snotty handkerchief in your pocket or bodice. When Kimberly Clark Corporation came out with Kleenex in 1924, they were originally intended for use with cold cream to remove makeup. It wasn't until two years later that customers wrote to the company, telling them they used these facial tissues for blowing their nose more than any other use. When a test was conducted in a Peoria, Illinois newspaper showing the two main uses, readers responded with 60% saying they used them as a disposable handkerchief for blowing their noses and Kimberly Clark changed their marketing strategy to reflect that, including this commercial featured on the Perry Como show in 1959. Soft, strong, pops up too. Kleenex tissues are best for you. When you're taking makeup off your face, 
Kleenex wipes off every trace. Soft, strong, pops like two. Kleenex tissues are best for you. By the way, in doing the research to find that commercial, I came across an internet urban legend about a supposed haunted Kleenex commercial from Japan that features a baby dressed as an ogre. And after there were some complaints about the commercial, a rumor started that the cast and crew that worked on it had either died or tragedy had struck them. None of which is true, but you can find plenty of versions of this cursed Kleenex commercial on YouTube, including ones that apparently become distorted if watched at midnight. Anyway, during World War II when rations limited the manufacturing of Kleenex, the technology was used to help create bandages and wound dressings. By the time the war had ended and production for tissue was back in place, Kleenex had become a household name. But not every tissue is a Kleenex. This is one of those brand names that become genericized over the course of time. The name Kleenex actually refers to its use, to clean the face, and the X was a tie-in from Kimberly Clark's other popular product, Kotex Sanitary Napkins. And Kotex was a combination of the words cotton and texture used to describe the material. Information for this episode was sourced from ThoughtCo.com, the Encyclopedia of Fashion, Bonjour Paris, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash thestorybehind. Stargate Pioneer from gunnageek.com, Matt from The One Word Go Show, Linguist Sam, Diane and Denise from History Goes Bump, Scott Smith from Recovering from Religion, Dan Brennick from Netflix and Swill, Jared Dunham from TheHistoryFile.net, Heather Welch from Sunshine and Power Cuts, Jason Bryant from Matt Talk Online, Gerald and Andy from Two Peas on a Podcast, Bandrew Scott from the Bandrew Says Podcast and Podcastage YouTube channel, Adam and Brian from Everyone Has a Podcast, Barry G, Nick and Justin from Epic Film Guys, and newest executive producer Jeremy Collins from Podcasts We Listen To. Thanks for listening.